What is up, ladies and gentlemen? I'm Adrian Conway. Welcome to another episode of More Than Fitness. I want to thank everybody who's been tuning in so far. We are a growing podcast with a growing audience, and our goal is to get some faces and names tied to some personalities that have been staples and cornerstones within the CrossFit game space and within CrossFit administration. So we're covering all the bases. Listen, today I have literally got a legend that I am honored to be sitting on the mic with. His name is Jason Kalipa. This guy is a husband. He is a father of two. He is the 2008 CrossFit Games champion. And hold on, I'm just getting warmed up here, Jason. Oh, you you got to be you gotta, oh, boy. You got to oh. be patient with me. All right, all right. Three times this man has been on the CrossFit Games podium. Eight consecutive CrossFit Games appearances, the 2009 Spirit of the Games winner, three-time Team USA competitor, which we're going to jump into that because I very much miss this style of competition we got that it once right. existed. <laughs> He's got over 20 locations, folks, in regards to this NC Fit that he has designed and started all the way back in 2008. Look at that Spirit of the Games award right there. That is OG, old school, the best stuff that you can come across. But the 20 locations is something that we are going to discuss. He's he's over that now when it comes to licensure and corporate wellness, all things you know included. He's got an online training app. And of course, he's a podcast host himself, effort over everything, um, if I'm hitting that thing correct. Is that right, Jay? Is that what you hey, got? Hey, you you did your homework. Yeah, no, we're, we're feeling good. I, I, was, I ran across the room because I'm in my office over here at our gym. I ran across, I grabbed the sledgehammer that I got that I won for um Spirit of the Games Award. It's it's one of my uh it's one of my favorite prizes I've ever gotten. Actually, I have it right here. And and listen, people are may may not believe this because as as we discussed briefly before we got on the mic, man, our community has been ever evolving, ever changing. We're getting new people that come into your affiliates, people that that come into the gyms that I work at, and athletes that are brand new all the time. They may not understand this. But that hammer has significance. Like you used that thing once at the CrossFit Games. Tell them about what what you used it for. See, only only the OGs understand. So in uh, in 2009, one of the events they had, which was actually, I don't, I mean, they're never going to do this again because it was almost impossible to make it fair. But it was cool at the time. What it was was they um, they dug out like I want to say it was like maybe like 10 feet worth of dirt. I could be wrong. And then they packed back in this 10 feet so that it was consistent across like a, a for sake of the argument, like, um, I don't know, maybe like a 15 feet by a hundred feet. For example, they dug it out, then they repacked it in and they supposedly packed it in all at the same level. Now, you know, <laughs> who knows, right? right? Then what they did is they put stakes, like these metal stakes. They were probably maybe, I don't know, five feet long, four feet long, something like that all across. So it was like a hundred of them or whatever it was, 50 of them. And the event was, I can't remember the exact rep scheme, but it was definitely rowing and uh, hitting with a sledgehammer to spike into the ground. You continued until you got to the point where you hit the spike all the way into the ground. Now, what they, what, what you, if you look at the video though, what was funny is like it started. It's like you know you kick off with a row and like everybody's all hot. Then you get your sledge and you're like ding ding, or maybe it was a row buy-in and then max. Uh, I, was that what it was, Adrian? Yeah. I, you know, from from what I can recall, I know that you guys were on the row, and then it was right to the like the the the, the driver, whatever you guys were driving in, and nail a stake. Um, it seemed like four time with a with some kind of cap. Yes, yeah, so I, th I think that's what it was. So I think it's like a, a thousand meter row buy in, and then whoever could put the stake stake in the ground the quickest. It, on the surface, the idea was really cool because you know you're trying to test accuracy, obviously some strength component by taking a sledgehammer and having to hit this small spike, which you know is is not as easy as you think. It's not impossible, obviously, but it's so funny because we get off the rower, and I think I got off the rower almost first, and I start hitting, and it's like dink, dink, dink. It's like going down like half an inch, an inch. And I'm like shit. <laughs> I look to my right and it's like dink, 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 and then dink, it just goes all the way down. I'm like, oh. And so that person had like a little bit of a better dirt, you know, packing job. So long and short of it, I start, I start hitting it, hitting it, hitting it. I'm getting really nervous because I thought maybe I had like a really hard patch, like there was a rock or something. And then I get like halfway down, and then boom, I hit it, it flies down. I'm like, yes. And uh, that was the end of it. So yeah, the sledgehammer that year was awarded to the person that embodied kind of like this idea of CrossFit where um, the, the community, the, the hard work, the overcoming adversity, all the things that we think about when we think about like a CrossFit community. Um, and I, I was honored with that in 2009 because the first event I ended up passing out on this run 
And I spent the rest of the games trying to battle back. Um, and so I ended up fifth that year. Um, and, uh, that, yeah, it was, that was a very memorable games for me for so many different reasons, but winning the spirit of the games one was a highlight for sure. I love that, man. And I, and I appreciate the fact that you kind of lean into even expressing the significance of those games for you, even though it wasn't one of the ones that you were on the podium for. And right. I think this alludes a lot of things in regards to the, the stuff that we'll discuss through this episode of, of perseverance and hard work. Um, clearly things that you embody. I've followed you for a very long time, man. And I know that you have had a, a very unique influence in the CrossFit space. Um, I, you know, I refer to you as, as one of the cornerstones of our community uh, because of your reach and your influence. But there's something very specific that I've always noticed about you, Jason. And it's like, you've got this energy that exists that is very contagious. Um, it, it can't be ignored, but it, but it's so powerful within you, man. And so the one thing, the question that I've got to kick this thing off with almost is that what would you, how would you describe yourself in regards to what makes you different, man? Cause you are different, different, right? That long list of accolades that I've listed off. This is like from, I haven't even known you all your life, but from 2008 on, it's like, dude, you've been running nonstop and not slowing down. Has it always been that way for you? Oh, I don't think it's always been that way for me, but you know, I, I appreciate the kind words, you know, I just try and Oh, we have a lot to be grateful for right now. Um, I have a lot of, you know, I just, I love to get after in the gym. I love to put in the hard work and, and it wasn't always that way. Right. Um, okay. uh, it was really throughout high school. I wasn't extremely motivated. I got to college. I ended up not getting in the same college. So my, my wife and I met when we were freshmen in high school and, you know, I knew at that point that she was going to be the one I'm like, that's it. I'm, I'm locked in. And I was working at the conventional gym and working the front desk. And I was just kind of a jackass, you know, just that guy in class, like the cool kid. And, you know, it's funny now I, I go back to my kid's school and I, 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 I help over there. I teach some stuff and I, I help at the kid's school. And it's so interesting. We just did this row last week and I, I put on this row and there was this dude just like, he's probably 12 years old. He's like in seventh or eighth grade. And he's just being that guy, you know, I just looked at him. I was like, Hey man, I was, I, I, I was you like, Hey man, just don't be that guy. Like just chill for a minute. And he was totally receptive. It was just like, but I was that guy. Um, anyway, yep. so in high school, I was kind of like, you know, whatever I got to college, I went to a junior college cause I, I didn't get accepted in the schools I was looking for. And the school I was going to go play football at, it ended up dropping their program. It was like very complicated, but anyways, I go to this junior college and just the first day of class just really opened my eyes to like my whole life. Someone had always been there right behind me trying to like push me forward. And in, in my, I went to a private Catholic um, school my whole life. And at that point there was always like this system that kind of supported you like a, like wind at your back. Right. Yep. And it was, it was very beneficial obviously, but it also didn't help me because that wasn't the reality of real world in the real world. No one cares about you. They, they, you, it's, it's all up to you and your responsibility to either succeed or, or, or fail. And when I went to junior college, I learned really quickly that if I wanted to be successful, if I wanted to make something in my life, it, it had to come down to me. So I really dedicated myself. I worked hard. I got into a sales job, uh, learned everything I could about the gym business, which then led me into finding CrossFit in 2006. And then just a lot of other stuff happened, but it wasn't always that way. I think it was just a, this awakening at this junior college, because it was just such a different demographic of people who were just had been stuck there for years. And that wasn't what I wanted to do. Right. And you mentioned that even in, you know, you finding CrossFit, of course, just kind of mentioning that is like the tail end of your, of your origin story, almost if you will. But I think it's, I think it's really important for people to understand that like someone who's even achieved what you've achieved and you're still on your way to, you know, knocking down many obstacles and probably high levels of success that you have yet to even have a vision for in your life. But it's like, it can be developed right is is kind of the the theme that i hear from from what you're saying right now it's like yeah i was once too cool for school i was kind of doing the thing and i had some great support when you say you didn't any longer have that wind at your back you of course had this adversity of like the college that then shut down that football program would you say that you needed that adversity to springboard yourself into kind of like finding that that effort and energy that you now embody all the time yeah i think i think what i needed was just a wake up call you know like it, I think the biggest wake up call for me was like two major things. It was one is that, you know, I, I, I knew I wanted to marry my girlfriend at the time. Like I, I knew okay. I wanted to be with her for the rest of my life. And I knew that if I wanted to be with her, I needed to be successful in some way, shape or form. And yep. when I graduated from high school, all of my friends, my peers, the people I had been connected to, the people that had their wind at their back that whole time with me, along with me, 
all had different journeys and my journey wasn't the same as theirs. Mm. And it was just really eye opening to me that at that point we were no longer peers. Yeah, we were friends or in my wife's case, like she was my girlfriend, but we were no longer peers in terms of like the trajectory of our lifestyle because they went on to a four year university, which I embodied at the time as like the pinnacle, yep. right, wrong or indifferent. It's just at the time that was the goal, right? And then I didn't achieve the goal, which is why I had to go to a school, a, a junior college. And when I went to junior college on top of that, so now I'm having like this insecurity, I'm having this sense of kind of identity crisis because I'm no longer that part of that crew. Right. And then I go to this junior college and first day of class, I'm not kidding. First day of class, this woman sitting next to me and we're all introducing ourselves like, Hey, I'm, you know, John, this is my second year. Hey, I'm whatever. I'm like, Hey, I'm Jason. This is my first, um, quarter semester, whatever it was here. And this woman sitting next to me, she's like, Hey, my name is, you know, Susan. And this is my seventh year here. And I just like, at that moment, I'm like, wow. I mean, this mm -hmm. was a college. I mean, you could, you could at most graduate with an associate's degree and it's no disrespect to her. It just was eye opening to me that I didn't want to be that person, right? Like, like if I wanted to marry this girl, if I wanted to go do things. So those are the two things that kind of like, wow. And, um, those are kind of some wake up moments for me. I love it. Hey man, even if it's a catalyst, like a handsome boy or an attractive young lady that, that makes you want to take the leap, man, at least you, you knew, you knew you having the desire to want to provide for a future family and marry, marry your spouse, man. That was, that was motivation in itself. For sure. And I knew I wanted to open up a gym at a really young age. Um, because I worked at the time I was working on the weekends when I wasn't playing, um, football or I also threw the shot, um, like in, in track and field, track field yeah. when I wasn't doing that, I was working the front desk at the, at the health club. And so I knew I wanted to be in that involved in that for some reason, like at a young age, I, I just, I wanted to be around it. So when I got to college, um, I had some great mentors who took me under their wing, taught me a lot about sales, taught me a lot about the business side of fitness, which then blended well when I heard about CrossFit, which through Austin Begeeping, who's on CrossFit seminar staff, OG, he introduced it to me. And that was when I started falling in love with this idea of a coach, a community. And then I tried to bridge those two together when I graduated from college. That's amazing, man. And I think it's a perfect segue to even like how CrossFit w was what was next for you. Um, because when you found CrossFit, and I think you mentioned it was 2006, like people will have no idea when we say this, unless they, they're an OG and been around this long themselves, but CrossFit was completely unheard of. CrossFit was completely vilified. CrossFit was like the, 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 you know, the shunned training methodology in the corner where can, traditional strength conditioning means, um, anybody that was already a franchisee type gym, global gym, like they were like, yo, no, not in my gym, not in my space, no dropping weights, keep your shirt on too much sweat on the floor. Right. So 2006 for you, you somehow fall in love with this. Austin McGeeving, what's he do? Take you to the gym? Does he just like hand you a barbell and say, yo, bro, hit it, 21, 15, 9, go? Yeah, I mean, you know, back then, I wouldn't even put it in the place like, I agree with what you're saying. I think that was like, actually like two years later, meaning like, you know, no one's even doing anything, right? Like, I'm with like, you. Like at that point, the the website had just came up, right? And a little bit earlier than that, I shouldn't say it just came up, but I, Austin's mom had been training Olympic lifting in San Francisco. And she was turned on to the work of the day through CrossFit.com. And so he started just pulling it up on the internet and we started just cherry picking, like messing around. And, you know, a lot of the excitement was around these ideas of, excuse me, movements I couldn't perform, but I didn't really get it at first. I, I, I really didn't understand. So we ended up going to, um, Freddie Camacho's gym, CrossFit One World. And I did my first workout, which was, uh, Fran actually. And I finished, and I was like, eh, I was like, okay, but I didn't get it. I, I didn't quite get it. So over the next six months, we cherry picked, we tried different things. Like one of the things that actually really captivated me in like the CrossFit mentality was that I got more work done in less time, right? So I was able to be really efficient with my time. And at the time I was going to school, I was working full time, selling gym memberships. I didn't have three hours. So whereas previously I'd hit a set of buys, take a little break, hit a set of tries. Now that was before phones. I don't even know what it would be like today, right? I'd be fuck scrolling for hours. But back then, right. You're just, you're just doing your thing. But when I was introduced to this, I saw of training. One of the first things that got me inspired was we did a hundred reps at 135 bench press for time. That was like CrossFit ish. And we would do that twice a week for weeks until we got our time down. So then I started falling in love with this idea of like racing the clock. And that really was what inspired me to, to continue on. Yeah. The intensity is a beautiful thing, man. And I remember you wholeheartedly, uh, you know, um, expressing and uh, if 
you know, correct me, but I think it's the title of your book. Is it Am the AMREP mentality? Yeah. So as many reps as possible. That was really a mind, mind opening, mind opening experience for me because what I realized was that, um, when you, when you have a clock, like really what Greg Glassman, uh, what I would credit him, I mean, you can, you can give credit for many things for him. I think part of it is like the idea that you have kettlebells inside of a hotel gym, the idea that kettlebells are even at a conventional gym, I think are largely due to his, his influence on the fitness space. But one of the biggest things I think is, is adding a clock to fitness because before that wasn't very commonplace. Now it's very commonplace, regardless of what functional training you, you get into. And so when I was introduced to the clock, it really changed my mindset of this idea of as many reps as possible. Like I'm going to go downstairs, I'm going to go AMRAP this, I'm going to come back up, I'm going to AMRAP work, I'm going to go back home, I'm going to AMRAP that. And that was really how I tried, started living my life. I'm going to AMRAP school. I'm going to AMRAP this. I'm going to AMRAP that. I'm going to be present and be focused. And obviously once I had kids and once things evolved, I started really embracing that mindset even more. And that's why I wrote the book, As Many Reps as Possible, um, later on. It's so powerful. And I... And I I, I equally have these same type of lessons that I think CrossFit was the catalyst for. It's like being yeah. able to compartmentalize your life because there's, I mean, just as uh, I, I too am an entrepreneur and, and when you wear many hats, it's a really difficult way to be present in the moment, whether it's you with your wife, you with your kids, you at soccer practice, or you coaching an athlete versus you, you know, uh, addressing the coaches on the floor uh, in a very different fashion. So I appreciate you framing that AMRAP mentality. Um, was that wh where did the idea for the book come from, man? Before you before you put that out on just on the shelves. Well, I mean, that's a that's a that's a opening a box. So when I um, so fast forward, right? So I, I was working at the conventional gym. I was introduced to CrossFit. Fell in love with it. Fell in love with the idea of a coach community. I ended up opening a gym in 2008 when I graduated from San Clay University. So oddly enough, when I was at the junior college, it was called West Valley College. Shout out to West Valley. Um, I went there for two years and I applied to San Clay University three times before I got accepted, which, you know, not that I was counting, but I was counting for sure because I applied once, got denied, applied again, got denied. I had to wait until I was um, two years out from high school because my transcripts were so poor to then negate those, right? Just start from scratch. And so I did two years at West Valley and then fast forward into Santa Clara. I ended up graduating with my wife and, and all of our friends at the same time, which was a big deal for me. But I graduated in 08. And at the time, then I opened up a gym called CrossFit Santa Clara and I won the CrossFit Games all around the same time. And that kind of kicked off this journey where I, I was as deep in the you know CrossFit space as you could really get in terms of competing professionally, opening up locations, working for CrossFit, um, teaching seminars. I was really, really deep. And as the years well, went I gotta, on- I gotta pause you real quick, Jay, because a lot of people aren't gonna understand this. So are you telling me in 2008, you won a quarter million dollars and started a franchise and it just blew up into what, five or six locations right out the gate? Is that how it was? Yeah, that's exactly how it was. And I, I won a quarter million, but you know how much I won for winning 2008 CrossFit Games? I think I won. Tell them about it. I think I won um, eighteen hundred dollars. I think I won. I'm, I'm, I won no more than two thousand. It was it was like fifteen hundred, eighteen hundred, and I got a pair of do win Olympic lifting shoes, which I had never had before. And actually, I think I got a Concept Two rower. And so that was a big day for me to to you know winning the CrossFit Games then, and then getting back on the podium in two thousand thirteen and fourteen. I would put the podium finishes in thirteen and fourteen as more special or more important to me than the 08 only because the amount of work I put in to accomplish those goals was so much greater than in 08. Um, so I ended up, you know, winning, I, I, we ended up opening up multiple locations, um, et cetera, et cetera. Well, as time goes on, uh, 2011, I have, uh, my first child, her name's Ava. And so, and then in 2014, uh, my wife and I have her second child, his name's Caden. So we have Ava and Caden. They're now turning next, like in two weeks, uh, 12 and nine. Well, in like 2012, 13, 14, those were really busy years for me. And I had to do a lot of reflection because at the time we had expanded to multiple locations. Um, I was no lo longer working on CrossFit seminar staff. It just didn't align with my schedule. But we had expanded globally through a corporate wellness account called Western Digital. And so I spent a lot of time overseas. I was in Asia all the time opening up these locations. Cause at the time, and even still today, we had, you know, 20 locations with them in Singapore, Thailand, China, Malaysia, you name it. 
So I was exp I was growing around the world trying to open these locations. Also, obviously managing our current locations in the Bay Area, right. and then um, competing. Right, I was trying to win the CrossFit Games, and I had my family. And I just found that I wasn't doing a good job at any of it. You know, I, I just found mm. that I was kind of like one foot in, one foot out on too much stuff. Like I'd be doing assault bike intervals in the garage while also being on conference calls with Asia. And it just, it just wasn't a good, it wasn't respectful to the people I was, I was with or the people I was like, it wasn't good on anybody. Right. Cause I was one foot in, one foot out, you know? And, and so I really had to check myself and basically I, I started embracing this idea of AMRAP mentality as many reps as possible. When I'm with the family, I'm with the family, when I'm at work, I'm at work, when I'm working out, I'm working out. And it's just a really good example. You know, like, like, you know, if you're doing burpees in your garage and your phone rings, you're not going to answer. You're just going to get after your workout. You're going to finish up. But, but why in real life, if I'm with my wife at dinner and my phone rings as an example, and it's not a priority, why am I getting up to take that? I'm, I'm not saying I do. I'm just saying like yeah. why in our workouts, we so present and focused, but in other areas we have a tendency to fall off. Absolutely. I want to take that same mindset into everything. And that was, that was the motivation for AMRAP mentality. And then I wrote the book because my daughter got leukemia. So it's like this big kind of jumbled approach of why I did it. <laughs> yeah. And you did a great job answering that, man. I really appreciate you diving back into basically the process for you and the growth that happened in a very short amount of time when it comes to owning a business and entrepreneurship. You, you had a very steep uh, growth over those, what, four to five years. Yeah. When it, when it comes to that, man, going all the way back to 2008, you opening CrossFit Santa Clara, did you have a vision for, hey, I'm going to have multiple locations. This is what it's going to be like. Yes, I'm going to inc include corporate wellness. Like I'm blowing this up. Was that a part of your initial business plan? Yeah, initially I, I knew I wanted to, you know, own a business that provided for my family, supported gym on, or supported other coaches and, you know, obviously impact as many members as possible. That was always the, the, the goal. Like the goal you know, because again, you got to remember, I came up in a system that was very sales business driven. I, I grew up the previous four years talking about nothing but numbers every single day. And then when I was introduced to CrossFit, it talked nothing but about cro uh, coaching. Mm -hmm. So I tried to bridge those two. Yep. Right? And, and whether I liked it or not, that was just how I was brought up. Like I had mentors who were very business focused and I had other mentors like Austin, who was very coaching focused. And I think that I was the example of, of the blend of that. Um, the corporate wellness and things like that were opportunities that presented themselves, but building a bigger business. And even today, um, like we're not even scratching the surface of what I want to accomplish in terms of the impact that I want to make in, in terms of providing for coaches and then impacting more members. Um, yeah, that's the motivation. I like it, man. And, th and there's so much stuff that you offer, right? Like you're a coach. You still do the thing with with offering programming and developing coaches. What what would you say from like the the perspective that you've been able to build throughout the years, Jason? Where it's like you look around the community, you are looking both inside and outside the CrossFit community at other affiliates and other gyms and global gyms, etc. What do you think some of the biggest pitfalls are for gym owners? I mean, if I want to summarize it, 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 and this is like the, the most fluffy answer, but I'm going to give it anyways. I think many gym owners don't treat their business like a business. They treat it like a hobby. I think at, at, at its core is that, right? Anytime you treat anything like a hobby, you're not going to really be very successful. Like imagine anybody who's a hobbyist at anything, how mm -hmm. good they ever become. Like, right. like, I don't know, like I have a hobby. For example, my hobby was to roast coffee. I'm really shitty at roasting coffee, <laughs> but it's a hobby of mine. So it's okay. Right. And I think that if you're a hobbyist who gets into owning a CrossFit gym or any type of gym, I think that that mindset is ultimately what is not good. And I think for all of us, and what I'm very passionate about is trying to level up the fitness space, in particular, the CrossFit space, because I'm always going to be pulled in as, as you know, a guy who's been, you know, I've been in the CrossFit space for so many years. I want to see the CrossFit space thrive. I want to mm -hmm. see it be more consistent. I want to be able to see people go in and have a positive experience, life-changing experience like many have, but some haven't. Right. And we as an industry need to do a better job of having those first impressions be as awesome as possible. And part of that is treating your business like a business, like, dude, answering your phone, responding to emails, providing good classes, having coaches that aren't on their phones. Like, it's not, it's just, it's just, uh, don't get me started, man. I get very passionate about this. 
Well, and I think it's obvious that you do, and that's why that you've had the ability to have the success, um, of course, that you have. Now, a- another layer of this is the corporate wellness involvement that you've had. That, to me, when I first started hearing about your ventures and what you were doing out there, I was like, man, to me, this blows my mind. I never once considered bringing CrossFit and its value in this teamwork environment, how it could change the structure of a company, the way they look at each other, the way they interact with each other. You know, like you mentioned, it's like getting the CEO and the janitor in the same class and let's do this. And right. now we're like a family. Where did that vision come from for you to take it to the business space? I mean, you know, corporate wellness is a really interesting um, piece of the model. I think that ultimately what I found was that when you're in our gyms, like the one I'm in right now, the connections that are fostered are incredible and that people really look to create friendships and whatnot. Well, imagine if you take that to a company, right, where the janitor is able to talk to the CEO who's able to talk to accounting. Not only does it connect to the people so they feel more connected to the company, but more importantly is that the efficiency goes through the roof. Because yeah. now if you have a guy in sales and a guy in finance it's like hey bobby i'm going to send you over a contract do you mind just getting that oh yeah no problem and whereas before if bobby sent you know over a contract you'd be like ah whatever i'll get to it in a couple of days so the efficiency starts to really improve and the culture starts to improve by having it in the in the office because we know that that's a byproduct of what could happen in the gym which is community based so that was really the inspiration we had a long journey um it started off by me bringing dumbbells and kettlebells to a company called ch reynolds at like 5 a.m i did that a couple days a week then that grew in another corporate another corporate then we did gopro then we did twitter then we did i mean it was just it just has evolved over the years yeah naturally just like anything else but it seems like it's something that of course um was a way for you to you know separate yourself in a, in, a, in, a, in a business fashion in a space where a lot of folks to me were, were just kind of following this uh template method and assuming that they had to do it the way that everyone else was doing it. Yeah, I mean, but it's all, you know, I I shouldn't paint this picture. It's not all rainbows. Um, You know, one of the downfalls of opening up, you know, having, so we have diversified revenue streams here at NC Fit. We own and operate brick and mortar gyms like the one I'm in right now. We have the NC Fit Collective, which is session plans, programming for gym owners that want to win. Like we really try and provide them with tools that we have in here. We have our end user app, we have corporate wellness. And on the surface, you'd say, wow, like that's cool. You know, diversified revenue streams make sense, blah, blah. But, you know, at times you have to be careful not to get distracted and to be, you know, going out and trying to get a new corporate account and taking your staff to a location down the street when you're not even optimizing your current brick and mortar. And so those were lessons that we had to learn along the journey that more is not always better. Now, if you could scale and if you could do good things and if you could make the right decisions, that's great. But just taking on more accounts was not the path um we had to learn to say no and and that was something that was very difficult for me to learn um you know using one of our accounts as an example you know you're getting paid let's just say a couple hundred dollars a session but now the goal was to evolve that into having full on-site locations but if you're not building up that full on-site and if the if the company doesn't look like they're going to you might just need to say, Hey man, we can't continue to do this because it's taking resources from our brick and mortar and there's opportunity costs there. And I think that that was something I didn't realize early on. Um, but I guess it's just one of those things you got to live and learn. Absolutely. Opportunity costs are the ones that I think are the, are the, those are the hardest things to account for and the hardest lessons to learn. It, it kind of, cause we all have these visions of, of grandeur. Um, and, and we, we kind of, dream up the work that it's going to entail to get there. And then we're like, Oh, there were, there were hidden things. There were hidden costs that I, that I never saw coming. And those, that's, that's a hard, uh, that's a hard punch in the gut, man. For sure. Um, for sure. And, and to mention like changes and evolutions, there was a time and you can correct me if I'm wrong, where you chose to back out of like affiliate mm-hmm. with CrossFit. Yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a long story, but the long story short is that Many people who don't know my full background, they don't understand how deep in the cross that I've been, the contributions that we've done on the back end that people don't see and the contributions that cross has done for me, right? Like the CrossFit games impacted my life more than almost anything else I could think of. Um, when my daughter got sick, the lessons that I learned through the CrossFit games and mindset were instrumental in us getting through that. And I'm forever grateful to CrossFit, to Greg, to the ecosystem for what they've provided me this platform that I've been able to build a business off of, but along the journey, um, it hasn't always been easy. It's been bumpy. And I had a vision for affiliates 
where I wanted to provide more consistency. I thought it was really important that we shared basic business practices with affiliates because I saw there was too many inconsistencies and long-term the barrier to entry was too small. The learning curve was too high and it was going to be detrimental to the brand of CrossFit long-term. I was convinced of that. Yeah. I still am by the way. Yep. yep. And it just, you know, that along with many other things just kind of drew, drew a wedge between me and, and some of leadership at, at former leadership at CrossFit. There was a wedge that was built because I was so bullish that, this idea of cream rises to the top will only be effective if once you become the cream, the, the, everybody else just brings you down. And so we needed to identify a way where mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's still motivating for a business to be an affiliate or, or even branded CrossFit, even though, so the, the struggle I had was that you'd go into one CrossFit and have a dramatically different experience than somewhere else. I think the license model has been good because it allowed people to try and create their own models. I get it. But at some point, I just wanted to share fundamental business practices, like having an AED if you're in California and, you know, 1099 versus W2 and leveling up people by looking at what type of zoning are they in, just basic foundational stuff. And I think that's where we kind of, ultimately, I think that's where we didn't see eye to eye. And after many years, it just... We re we rebranded from NorCal CrossFit to NC Fit to be more indicative. We had a few different programs we offer. We weren't only offering CrossFit at the time, and to also be more in control of our own destiny. Mm -hmm. um, there was things that CrossFit had been doing at the time that was was we we struggled with, and I I had very clear communication about that because we had corporate accounts, we had partners that didn't see eye to eye with what they were doing, and neither did we. So we rebranded as a way to control what was in our control. And I think anybody with a business would understand why we would do that. And then in the future, I think just our, that wedge continued to grow until we just need to say, Hey, you know, we just don't align with, with the vision. But as of recently, we've realigned with the vision and we're on the same path. And I just want to be really clear about something. I never was un, I've been unwavering in my support for the methodology of CrossFit. I've been unwavering in my support for the community. However, from a business perspective, I did not have the same eye to eye vision for what former leadership did. I just don't. And, and now we do. And so we've reaffiliated and it's all good. And, and I think it's a beautiful thing, man. I think that for some people who have been around for a long time, might've been like, oh, well, Jason, those guys are not CrossFit anymore. And they might've had this to say or that to say, but when it comes down to it, it's not their business. It's yours. And you had your business and your people's best in mind with what you thought was the proper and, and timely action, right? And, and as a business owner myself, I completely understand that. Um, you got to protect yours. Now, I think the, the real fruit of the conversation even is that when you felt as though CrossFit had pivoted and started to trend and restructure and revision and redream up exactly what it was going to look like to have affiliate support or what it was going to mean to be uh, a CrossFit affiliate that you were willing to come back into the fold and, and reaffiliate, of course. So can you share a little bit about what, what helped you feel more confident and comfortable with now, you know, putting this, this Mecca of time and resources that you've created with an NC fit back under, uh, the CrossFit umbrella? Yeah. So, I mean, again, there is so much more to this story than I want to share just because I want to focus on the future and not talk about the past. And I was on the Savon podcast recently and he, he brought up some stuff that he had seen that, you know, I've never talked about, and I'm not going to talk about it publicly because I think that for people, they don't, you know, I, I would, I would encourage anyone listening who has an opinion to realize that I taught for CrossFit. I opened gyms. I've brought sponsors, millions of dollars of sponsorship to the CrossFit games. I'm as CrossFit as you can get. Yep. But at some point, you know, as a, as a, as a business leader, we have a, duty and a responsibility to our members and our staff to do what we believe is in the best interest to grow forward. And I think it's a, it's a, it's what we, 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 it's unfortunate we were ever put in any of these situations. I wish sure. we had been more eye to eye earlier on, but it just didn't happen that way. And so you asked the question like, why, why now? Right? Mm -hmm. Well, when, when leadership changed at CrossFit and Eric Rosa took over, I met with Eric. It was fine. Like nice guy, like all good. I never felt compelled um, with with his vision for the future. I thought it was okay. I, I thought that 
CrossFit needed some time to kind of overcome some of these struggles that it, it had. But when Don became CEO, he's been a member of the gym for a lot of years. I felt more um, excited about the future of where CrossFit's going to go and that they'd be more open to talking about the things that I'm really interested in, mm -hmm. which is leveling up affiliates and having consistency. Like I'm really interested in that. And if they're not interested in that, then I don't know what to tell you because I believe the biggest hurdle that CrossFit has right now, the biggest issue is that you could have someone go in to a CrossFit gym and have a poor experience. And they're going to go tell 10 friends how poor of an experience they had at a CrossFit gym or the fact they tried to email or call a CrossFit gym and no one's gotten back to them in weeks. And that's the biggest struggle we have right now. And as an ecosystem, we need to do a better job to encourage best, better business practices because that one person can instead go in and have a life-changing experience and go tell 10 friends of them about how phenomenal CrossFit is. And I think that, you know, a few of the things that I learned along the way is that no matter what I do, no matter where I go, I will always be connected to the CrossFit space because of my previous life and accomplishments, et cetera. And I want to do whatever is in my power to support is really where I'm at is I want to do anything I can to be a part of the solution of that, like to grow that and not to detract from that. And that, that took some kind of like soul searching and some time for me to realize, but that's where I'm at now. And that's what I'm excited about. I love it, man. And I appreciate your, your ability and willingness to share a little bit of that backstory. Cause I think it's important. And I think it's a very adult and grown up conversation that perhaps a lot of people find themselves in that are business owners, right? Like, ah, do I stay? Do I go? Is it worth the investment? Let me ask you when we, when we talk about having a vision for the future, sure. um, is, is there something uh, aside from answering your phone and email best practice. I mean like that, we shouldn't even have to talk about that stuff, right? Like, um, we shouldn't, but, we, but, but it's not, a, it's, it's not a standard, right? Correct. I mean, I, I bet you, if you go call 10 gyms in your area right now, I bet you, I bet you, um, one of them will get back to you in the next three days. Anyways, sorry. No, no, come on with it, man. It's, 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 you're, you're, you're preaching the truth and, and I've experienced it myself. So I, I completely agree. And I understand that, but from your perspective, from CrossFit HQ, Right. Yeah. How can, how can we better support affiliates? How can we continue to navigate, inspire, hold accountable, whatever it is, our community so that we continue to kind of level up and the tide rises in unison? Well, I mean, I think that's a, that's a, that's a difficult question and it's going to come with maybe some pullback before it, things might get worse before they get better. And, and okay. this, this, this may not be what people want to hear, but I do think that some attrition um, and mm. some consolidation might actually be a good thing for the space. I think that what is not a good thing for the space is an affiliate owner who feels burnt. They maybe have been doing this for a few years. They're passionate about CrossFit, but you know, they took over the gym and, and they just, they're not making it work and they're, they're dumping money in and they're making, you know, they're a full-time attorney or whatever they are. Yep. And then they want to sell the gym. And so a group of members say, Hey, we love this community. It's impacted our lives. It's changed my life. I want to go ahead and take this over from you. And the reason why they want to take it over is because they want to see the continue, the community continue. Right. And there's four of them that partner up and they take it over. I don't think that's the right model moving forward. I think in that particular case, what might be better off is to let that gym close and to let those members disperse to other communities nearby where the person is really trying to take it and build it into something special into hundreds and hundreds of members that could be financially stable, that could pay their coaches more. And I think that as a, as an industry, it might take some consolidation. Like I think that maybe making the barrier to entry a little bit higher with the affiliation fee, I think making um, maybe more education components required. Mm. I think those are examples of things that would deter someone who's like, oh yeah, I want to open an affiliate just because I love CrossFit to being instead, hey, you know, I want to open an affiliate because I want to be able to provide for my family or, or be able to run a sustainable business while I'm over here running this, but I want to be able to pay my coaches. And I think one of the other problems we have to do is, as an industry is, level up what a professional coach really is. Correct. You know, there's two big problems I think we have to solve for. One is that the average gym owner right now, let's just say makes 30 or 40,000 a year. If you're making 30 or 40,000 a year as a CrossFit owner, how much can you pay your coaches? And so then all of a sudden it's like, well, now if it's a part-time gig and you're getting paid $15 or maybe it's a trade out, what type of quality product can we have on the floor? And so I think this is, this is a very big conversation about identifying people who want to treat it like a business so that the owner could take home six figures, that they then could then pay their coaches more, which will then have a better product on the floor, which will then have more breed more and more people telling people how awesome CrossFit is. 
It's a yeah. very complicated situation now. Right. No, there's no doubt. And business, bi listen, money is exchanging hands and we're doing it around a service that everybody involved is so extremely passionate about that it right. does make it very complicated. Like you mentioned, like I can't fault these four individuals that want to come together and just keep the community alive because they love it so much. They want, they'd give it away for free if they could. Well, guess right. what? If you guys want to give it away for free, you can do that. Start a nonprofit, right? Like do something where you can actually give it away and then it protects still the rest of the high quality affiliates from having bad experiences or he having hearsay happen where I walked into a gym and I never got an email or I, no one was there at the front desk or the coach was coaching class and I didn't see him for 30 minutes because he was in the back and all of it, all right? Of because all of that because we, and we have to have these conversations and these conversations were not happening until as of recently. And I think that's mm -hmm. very, that's, I, I think one of the things that we need to do is have a culture of, you know, at our gym, we have a culture of feedback where we want our coaches to receive feedback on how they're performing, or I want to receive feedback. I have a employee survey over there. I, we want to receive feedback about how are we doing? And I think that one of the things that we need to have is a culture of, of making it okay to talk about financial success in CrossFit, meaning it is not a bad thing to talk about money. And I did like a, I do these weekly shows called Coffee Clipo, where I just oh, share yeah. things that are on my mind, right? I love them. And the one that I had the other day was like, if you can't, if you don't make, you cannot give. And I was inspired by a annual fundraiser we do for a pediatric cancer. But in particular, it's like gym owners, if we don't go out there and go thrive, if we don't make money, how can we then give our coaches more money? And then how can we give to our members better service with better coaching, with better equipment? And then ultimately, if we don't go out there and make, how can we give to things that we really care about? Like different organizations, uh, uh, et cetera. So we need to, we need to demystify this idea that if you talk about money and growth, that you're somehow anti CrossFit, like that, that, that needs to be broken down. I think. No, I'm, and I'm with you and I completely agree for some time. It was almost like shunned or looked down upon and it's just not the way good business, good business works. So hopefully it's continuing to transform, but look, man, I can't keep you on this business topic. Cause look, we could roll on this specifically for yeah, hours. Bro. I love Listen, obviously, yeah, yeah, yeah. we, you, you have pushed into this space. You created an identity for yourself, even as a competitor. So I got to touch on a couple things. There's some questions that have been sure. on my mind. You've been to eight CrossFit games, um, some more brutal than others. In your opinion, mm -hmm. scan those eight, man. Tell me which one was the most grueling test that you took. Oh, man, that's tough. Um, I mean, I can't speak on the the games as a whole because – I do think your perspective shifts based on how well you perform. So if I look at my performances, I had a first, a fifth, a 16th, a seventh, a fifth, a third, and a second, or something like that. Like, so basically top 10 every year, except for one. Mm -hmm. And if you were to ask me like, which one was the worst? I'd be like, dude, the one that I took 16th, that was, that was the most grueling, whatever. Was it? I don't know. Maybe I just didn't perform as well, but there's certain events that stand out where it's like, dude, those were, that was a tough event. And the ones that stand out to me that like, I don't want to say I have nightmares about, but they, they stand out to me would be, um, in 2009, I passed out on a seven K hill run. That was a, that, that was me not learning how to control my emotions mentally, but it wasn't physically the most, even though I literally passed out on the floor, it, it wasn't the most physically demanding. Okay. The bird, um, the, um, camp Pendleton triathlon was the most physically taxing. I think I could think of. What that was, was it was a, a open water swim, a short bike ride, uh, and then like up and down uh, hill run. I mean, did you do that one? I did not do that one. We, we were on a team that year. So that one for you guys must have been 2012, I believe. Dude, this run. And I'll tell you what the worst part. So this run. So by the time you get to the run, they, they scored it as two separate events. So you did the, the, the swim, the bike, and then like maybe a 100 meter sprint. And I remember it was me, Asimiliolo, and Froni. We were all like together on the bike. And it was a single speed bike. So you couldn't go that fast. And I raced BMX bikes as a kid. So I'm very comfortable on bikes, but you couldn't get you couldn't get any faster. So we drop our bikes. And the finish line for event one was like a hundred meters up this hill. So we're riding, riding, riding. We throw our bikes and we all sprint to this hundred meter dash. And we get there and boom, there's your first score, right? So depending on where you finish. And then after that, it was like, okay, we recomposed ourselves. And at the time they said it was going to be like a seven K up and down, up and down. But dude, it was like, I don't even know how far it was. It was so far, Adrian. It must've been, 
it was straight up and straight down, straight up and straight down. Um, for anybody who's a Marine, it was called um, Camelback Mountain. San Camelback Mountain, I think, was what it was called. And it was just straight up and straight down. So you were exhausted on the way up, and you were beat up on the way down. Exhausted on the way up, <laughs> beat up on the way down. Your feet were just wrecked. And at the top of every switchback, they had a Marine, like maybe every mile, every half mile, whatever it was. And this is the part that made it so hard is that you're trying to win a race. It's not like you're just trying to like walk this, right? You're trying yeah. to win. And the field started to separate. And so you couldn't really see anybody at that point. And I'd walk up to Maroon at this point, I was like jogging or walking. And I was like, hello. You know, I was like, uh, excuse me, sir, how much further do we have? And it was always the same answer for like miles. It was always, you have one mile left, sir. I, I don't know if they did this on purpose. I don't know if I had <laughs> if I was delusional when this happened, but uh, I swear to you, bro. I went one, two, three. By the time I got to the third, fourth guy, I just like, hey man, like, thank you for your service. And I just kept going. Like, I didn't even ask, like, because <laughs> so, anyways, long story short, finished that. And then we had to do a obstacle course there. And that was when just people were just so wrecked. I mean, it was just that was the most brutal physical um activity i've ever i've ever done because you did this crazy triathlon and then like 30 minutes later you had to do a um, obstacle course we had to like jump and climb and whatever that was tough yeah and for people that don't even understand first of all you can go find us on youtube go ahead and youtube the 2012 crossfit games pendleton race like go check that out but then to understand that these athletes went through this such a long endurance grueling test like jay saying up and down up and down and then it's like cool rinse rinse rest for whatever an hour and then you've literally got to sprint your face off so <laughs> sprint your face off is a great way to describe it like it, it and, and so the, the drasticness of the way that your muscles go through contractions going from endurance to then that like fast twitch man that had to be so destructive and and you can remind me, but in this year, did you guys even have a rest day the next day or was it right into more competition? I can't remember. I think we might've had a rest day because dude, okay. I, was, I was just broken. And <laughs> you know, the parts that they don't talk about in the CrossFit games, and I don't know how things are the last couple of years, but for years, right. You'd, you'd wake up super early. You'd jump on a bus. I mean, so for camp Pendleton in particular, and also we did another event at, um, Santa Monica Pier mm -hmm. and a few other you'd you'd get up like they, they'd say like the report time was like 4 a.m. and you're just on this bus just exhausted and then you show up it's still pitch black and it's like all right man you're in just your compression shorts and you're swimming and it's like all right let's it's game time um but I didn't get much sleep before some of that events because you know you're anxious you're nervous it was always the first event that would always cause me a lot of anxiousness uh, once I got past the first or second event, I was good to go. Regardless of how I performed, I was ready to rock. Yeah, it's, it, it is one of those overlooked aspects. And I think people do talk about it when we storytell now, but the game has changed a little bit um, in regards to like right now, the last few years, you know, it's been in Madison. And a lot of times the schedule seems to be, in my opinion, more structured, oh, catered yeah. to high level performance versus like almost trying to catch the athletes off guard. Like, I feel like that's what it was historically. It was like, okay, Hey, guess what? Now we got you. You're going on this and now you're about to go. Yeah. You don't know what you're going to do. I mean, you know, in 2010, they put us in this, like, um, like this vault and then you walked out and they told us what the event was right when it happened. Um, you know, stuff like that. Right. It just, it, it used to be a lot different. I think back then, and there was no schedule. You wouldn't really know what you were going to do, which made it difficult from an ESPN perspective. Oh gosh. Yeah. To be a storyteller and, and to be a camera crew, dude, I got to experience behind the scenes for the very first time this year, really. And like to see what goes into a production, um, to have the, like the, the 10, the 10, you know, trucks back there. And like, yeah. it's all out almost what, what they described to me is, is equal to the Super Bowl, Um, and then to be back there and it's like these camera, these cameramen and the camera crew have worked like world series. They've worked Super Bowls yet. They love to do our sport and they love it because they don't know what's coming. So it like wow. excites them. Now they yeah. said it's a big headache, but they love the the unknown and unknowable. Yeah, I mean, and, and I think that's an interesting component. I'm I'm curious where the sport is going to go in the future. I think um, I'd love to hear from the CrossFit Games at some point what the charter of the games are and where they want to go, and is the charter um, not to go off on a tangent, but is the charter to test for the fittest athlete on earth who could accommodate, who could learn new skills like in a very brief amount of time, right? Or is the charter to make these athletes who are incredible look like gladiators out in front of like, what is the charter? Is it to 
Because I think you're you're thinking differently. Like, so for example, people always, no matter what Boz comes up with for the games, no matter what, people are going to have their opinions. Always. I think that if there was a clear delineation, like, hey, if you're testing for the fittest on earth, it's okay to test them on unique skills and give them five minutes notice. Like, yeah. that's just part of the game. Like, you're either ready or not. And I think if that's the charter, like, fuck, let's go. Like, all right, I'm in. Or is the goal to allow to these athletes to express their fitness in a way that's, you know, on TV more desirable. Well, maybe we give them those events, you know, a day in advance, or maybe we give them an hour or two to practice, et cetera. I'm just using this as an example, I think of, of I wonder where the game's gonna go in the future, that's all. Yeah, and, and I think it's a really great question, honestly. And 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 we're at a point in our sport where there, you know, what what people want to see from a sport perspective is they're they're coming out of the woodworks with opinions like, hey, we want to see a movement list. We want to see movement standards at the beginning of every season. We don't want to be caught off guard because of judging and this and that. And I know it's got to be something that we're working tirelessly on behind the scenes. Yeah. I can say, I can say for sure that the team is putting forth their best effort, even right now in regards to quarterfinals. This test that just came out you know, um, last weekend for these athletes. Uh, so I think that's a, that's a really great topic that you bring up. And in my opinion, when we think about what CrossFit is, is this purity, if we're, if we're testing for the fittest on earth, we continue to have to have that, that unknown and un, you know, unknowable element to it. But I'll tell you what, from telling a story perspective, there might be some value in making things more quantifiable and predictable and then letting some of the best athletes in the world just go throw down. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that, um, from a sport perspective, it's very difficult to have unknown and unknowable indefinitely. And the reason why it's, that's tough is because, especially as a commentator, you can't revert back to any previous like records. Like, hey, back in 2014, this record was set by Jason Kleep on this event. Like there's no, and as a spectator, it's difficult because you're always relearning what the sport is essentially every time you turn on the TV. And I, I think that there needs to be a balance there. In the future, if it wants to grow you know, exponentially, I think that it needs to be more visually easier to, to, to get engaged on because that, that's just my take on it. Um, but you know, whatever the games wants to be about, I, I think that they should just keep doing what they're doing. If that's what the goal is, you know? And, and I think that's what it, what it is. It's about whatever, whatever we are, it's continuing to own that and move forward in the best way that we think of course is, is capable with partnering with these broadcasts that are going to depict the story, but also, really reflect what goes on in affiliates as well to continue to be yeah. that large pillar to to push people into nc fit and push people into crossfits all across the world because they saw you know so and so do this amazing clean and jerk or snatch or walk on their hands or hold a handstand whatever it is um i think that they can continue to be a pillar for the whole success of the methodology in the business um you know we mentioned this earlier in conversation dude but when you were coming up as well there was this unique experience that the top athletes in our sport had and each year just shortly i would say into the fall months and you can correct me if i'm wrong october november ish yeah we would literally have like the the the, the top 12 athletes in the world per se you know we had a representation from the united states europe australia um was it was it just the three i forget or was it like team usa versus the world i forget exactly how it played out the first ever year so if you want to go back to some like yeah old school like the first ever so the way it worked this is in 2012 i think was the first year 2012 it was in london that was the first ever uh I call it Team USA just because that was the team I was on, but it was Team USA versus the world event. That's what it and was. And they called it the Invitational. It's the first year. Yep. And what it was was they stacked up the top three from the United States men, top three women against the top three women and men from um, the world at that point. Yep. And that was, they, they call it the Invitational. And it was a good way to, to drive attention to the European market and to show them the love. That first year was just mind blowing dude i'm telling you man we did it in uh, my 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 memory might be a little bit off but i'm 99 sure that first year we did it inside of an airport hangar i know we ended up doing it inside of an airport hangar in berlin as well but man i'm telling you the place was like i feel like we were the beatles dude we went over there and it was like you know rich Froning with his shirt off it's like every you know people are just freaking out it was, <laughs> it, was it was so much fun and obviously you know we won. So that made it even better. Um, but that was, th those events were really, really good. After that, I think if I'm not mistaken, the next two years, they added additional teams. Um, the, the, the final time I was on it. So I was on it 2012, 13 and 14 in 2014, 
it was hosted actually in San Jose, California. So the second, which is my hometown, um, the first one was in London. Second one was in Berlin. And then third one was in uh, California. Oh, dude. And we got to describe a little bit because I, I think what the experience was like is, of course, the top athletes in the world. Um, it was filling a vacancy where, you know, nowadays, if, if folks can can kind of compare it, it's kind of like to the Rogue Invitational in regards yeah. to the timing of year, right? Like the CrossFit Games is come and gone, like the Apex had passed us, and we're kind of yearning for some type of competition. In rolls the Invitational. You're sending the best CrossFit athletes in the world to go in one location and throw it on together. We can all watch it on YouTube. Um and and how was it? So you guys showed up what two days before, a few days before to kind of learn how to throw down as a team. And then I know the competition was only one day. It was like what two hour competition, like five yeah. events or something. Yeah. So I think the first year, um, actually, um, Josh um, Everett was our coach. It was me, Matt Chan, and uh, Rich, and then for the guys, and yep. we had a training session in Malibu. I think we had. We had like one or two training sessions ahead of time. Okay. I, th I think in future years, we might've had a training session, maybe, maybe one or two. I can't remember, but we definitely showed up a couple of days in advance to get in training sessions. And then, um, like the next year was me, Ben Smith and Rich Froning. And then the following year was, um, I think it might've just been Rich and I actually, I think they only had two for the third year and man, it just, yeah, it was, it was fun because you're right. It was like the rogue. Um, do you remember the invitational, uh, not the invitational, but the team series? Oh yeah. It's similar to that, right? You had, you created these teams. It was a lot of fun and it gave the community something to kind of rally behind. I, I think for me, it was like one of the funnest things ever. I mean, in my garage still till this day, I have a really cool, like, um, poster from there that I took. It was, you know, I traveled back from Berlin with it. Yeah, dude, I, I, it's, it's still some of my most fondest memories, even of just being a, a fan and a spectator of the sport. We're watching those throwdowns. So, uh, okay. you know, team, I don't know what we got in our resources in the bag and for the, for the plans of the future, but let's bring back the invitational folks. You know, dude, I think, I think the invitational, I, I hope the athletes would get fired up about that. I think it'd be a lot of fun. Um, do you remember the first ever rogue, the, the I shouldn't say first ever, the only rogue fitness versus again, faster throwdown in Lake Tahoe. Oh. Oh my gosh, do I remember it? I I fantasize about exit like something like that existing now. Like I'm like, oh, they could do it in this city. They could bring these athletes together, put them in two houses, like just make it happen. It was I'll so good, man. If we, you know, that was in 2000. I don't even know that that was maybe 2010, maybe. Yeah, it's a throwback yeah. right there. Oh man, if anybody hasn't seen these YouTube videos, it was so good, dude. There is a video of Pat Barber and Chris Spieler racing down a hill. And if, if you want some damn good CrossFit footage, like old school shit, go look that one up because, oh man, that was, that was a good time too. And I, I hope things like that come back around. You know, I think, you know, obviously the sports evolved, it's more professional. There's people that are making great money from it. And I hope they make even more money. I hope, yep. I hope all the athletes thrive. I also just hope that, you know, as a sport, um, you know, the, the, the athletes remember like without the fans, they wouldn't be able to do what they do. And I think that they need to continue to show the love and, um, you know, be a part of the community too. And I, I think that I'm not saying they're not, it's just, I think that's something that's really important to the culture because, you know, people coming up in the sport across, it means a lot to them to have their, you know, their idol, their, their athletic idol, you know, give them the, give them the time, take a picture with them, et cetera. That was, that was always something that was really interesting in the sport that you could be competing and it's yep. so easy to want to kind of like hermit up in the corner. But if you make yourself accessible, you'd be so shocked at like how meaningful it is for these people who are there to come watch at the CrossFit Games, just to give them a little bit of time and take a picture. It's so meaningful to them. I, I would I would encourage any athlete listening to remind themselves. I told myself a long time ago, I would never say no to a picture or whatnot, because without the fans, like the sport would not be able to be there. And I think that it's important that they feel the love so that it continues to snowball to get more and more fans engaged in the sport. It's everything. And, and it really is. And I appreciate you saying that even from almost like a, a OG mentor to some of these young athletes is never forget uh, kind of what put us all on and put us all in this this position that we find ourselves in now. And that's that's an interesting point, actually, Jay, you bring up is that, you know, back when you came up through the sport and yep. when I found the sport, even in 2011, it was like there 
everybody who was somebody to some degree in our sport was an affiliate owner, was pursuing or on CrossFit level one seminar staff, or was like a head coach at their affiliate. And they, but they had a direct connection to their community locally right. and even beyond. How do you think that affects the sport now? Do you see that being something of concern or like, do, do we worry about the athletes being too detached at the current moment? Uh, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, yes. I think that, I think that what drove engagement was storytelling. I think what you're doing is really valuable. So, um, you obviously have a, a wealth of knowledge about many things. But, you know, you brought up earlier right, is, is that one of the reasons why you have this podcast is to engage with or your, your podcast is to engage with people and to learn about who they are, because yeah. you're noticing that some of these newer athletes, you weren't familiar with who they were. And I think that that's really mature. That's really, that's, that's, that's really enlightening for me because I agree with you. I want to feel more connected to the athletes that are competing. I just don't know much about them. Yeah. And I think that what happens is for us, you know, when we were coming up, you know, we were coaches, we were owners, we were seminar staff. We'd go meet with people in person teaching CrossFit seminars, and there'd be a level of engagement with me to get to know me as a human being. And nowadays, I, I think I'd encourage the athletes to be on long form like this, to 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 contribute on long form videos so that people can really get to know who you are and your background, your story, so they could feel more compelled to watch you succeed or maybe you know, compelled to, you know, be a part of your journey of maybe failure and that's okay too. But I think this world where it's just like hands off, like just Instagram, put up a caption and, and move on. I just think long-term for athletes it also for their own brand, I think it's important to, to connect at a deeper level so that people can really feel like they're a part of your journey. And I think the best way to do that is through long form personally, but I think just putting yourself out there is important. And, and obviously I think another way is, you know, coaching, you know, being in the community, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that, and that's a, that's a, that's a key factor of success is to know and be known. Right. And, and I, and I think it might've been, I, I don't, you know, I could, I could be, you know, making this complete wrong assumption, but I want to say that I learned it through CrossFit and it might've been Greg, one of his foundational talks, like many years ago, some video that I saw on YouTube, but it was like, you have to be interested, but you also have to be interesting. Right. In order to capture and convey someone's attention. And it's like from our perspective of fans in today's sport, it's like, oh, they look like they're interesting, but are they really interested in the community? Does it does it go both ways for a lot of these young athletes today is the bigger question. And I think if they're willing to show that, if they're willing to get involved, if they're willing to try to teach and inspire and educate to some degree. Everybody can do it on their own terms. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying everybody got to be killing it and be a level three coach and, and be right, on seminar right, staff. Right. No, no, not saying any of that. But if they look like they're adding value to the community and not just trying to go be the fittest on planet Earth, then I think it would tremendously add value to their own, you know, their own personal brand. And I'm sure you would agree with this, but I can tell you right now, Jay, that from the position that I'm in, opportunities to even get on level one seminar staff back in the day, um, opportunities to host a podcast like this and sit down with folks like you. It's all only because I was willing to put my neck on the line and put myself out there. Um, even if it would have been more convenient for me to just kind of nestle into my corner, focus on training, uh, only coach the, you know, 100 athletes I've got out here in Utah or something like that. But it's kind of taken those progressive steps in order to let yourself one be known, but also know other people. Yeah. I think you're hitting the nail on the head. You know, one thing that's interesting, and I guess I'll ask you a question is, is, you know, in jujitsu, um, mm. I, I, I'm a big jujitsu fan and in jujitsu, there's this villain. I'm a, I'm a, I'm going to say he plays the villain, but I actually think he's a really nice guy in real life. His name is Gordon Ryan. Have you ever heard of him? I haven't. No. Okay. So Gordon Ryan is like, he's, he's very good at jujitsu. He's, he's, he's the greatest nogi grappler of all time. Okay. But he he plays this role on social media that's phenomenal where he calls people out, he's he he talks some smack and there's some smack talking between a few different schools right now and it's super engaging. Like one guy's telling the other one that he, you know, basically uh put like lotion on before their match and the other one's telling them that he's on steroids and then like there's just a bunch of like like low key beef that keeps the engagement high. I'm curious in CrossFit the culture has always been like one of like, let's all rise up together. Let's thrive from a competitor perspective. It's never really been like a villain. Um, maybe the, I mean, I don't even know. I can't even think 
all, like I think actually Dave played the best villain out of anybody for years. He did a good job of that. Who do you think is the villain? Or let me ask you, does CrossFit need a villain to engage more audience because everybody's so nice? I, I certainly believe that it would help. And I certainly believe that Dave wore it so well, man, in the history oh, well, of our sport. Right? And and really what what we what he was doing, and we and I don't know that he did it intentionally. I don't know if we recognized it in the moment, but he protected us from having to go head to head with one another because of the perspective that he shaped around himself, right? Programming these brutal workouts, punishing us for some to some degree, having these, having these tests where the better you do, the more you have to do, right? Yeah. You have to be willing to suffer more to earn the points and die for those points. Um, but I love it. Listen, and I, you know, I came from a, a lot of my initial coaching in the space and and challenging and our, uh, some of my close relationships came from you CrossFit with Tommy Hackenbrook. Right. We, we both played college football. So he was always really great at creating a, a villainized perspective of other competitors and it wasn't like we looked down upon them but it was like hey you know those guys over at invictus this is what they're doing this is what they're thinking hey right, those guys right, over right. those guys over at crossfit new england this is what they this is what they got going on and this is why we got to beat them and this is you know so we we always had this ability from the camps that i've have come from to um put a personal chip on our shoulder it wasn't so public but it was only because again you mentioned this it's like is that okay in our space? It's such a different vibe from the everyday community members to what we're doing on the competition floor. Dude, hundred percent. I, I, I'm curious who's going to come out and just kind of be that guy. And I, I actually think the sport will thrive because like, I, I think that Gordon Ryan, and maybe it's just cause I'm drinking the jujitsu Kool-Aid. Right. But I think that out of his, wh however many followers he has, I bet you 30% of them, 20%, 30% just engage with him because they're, they're not jujitsu athletes. They just love like the way he, he like, they like the, the drama. They like the, they like it. And I, I'm just curious for the sport, if that's going to be a piece for the future to story tell in a positive way, of course, but also having these athletes story tell kind of on their own way and creating this rivalry that then people want to be captivated by and see, Oh, who's going to win. Is it going to be the, you know, uh, you know, who this person or this person, you know, oh, they said this about this person. I just, I, I wonder if the sport needs that or if it doesn't need that and it just, it's all good. Anyways. Yeah. I it, No, I think it's a great conversation, man. It, it's certainly the fun aspect of sport that I grew up watching, right? From an NFL fan to an NBA fan. I was, I was drawn and I yearned for the storylines, right? I wanted to hear yeah, right what what michael my, what michael jordan said to larry bird or what michael jordan said to carl malone as he ran down after he dunked on him and like you know the the head to head the 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 nastiness or the back and forth that is often um you know we don't get a chance to see behind the lens very much and i think you know I, the bigger the bigger curiosity that i have even to your question is now that the next generation is certainly coming forward and like taking the sport and grappling it like are we having less of an opportunity to see the villain arise because now they're kind of here from the time they're 18 19 from within the crossfit gyms it was like mm. almost when we were finding it as adults at least we had these personalities and yeah. we had worked worked full time for a living we had chips on our shoulders we were like ah screw that guy like you know yeah, now it's yeah now it's different it seems like a different vibe well and, and i mean that brings up a whole nother point too like Obviously, you and I could riff on CrossFit stuff all day, but I mean, it does bring up an interesting point about, you know, the youth and where that's going to go with the sport of CrossFit and, and what role that plays. Um, you know, I have my own opinions about it with my children, but I sure. think for every, every child's different. Every parent is different. I think that they need to find what works for their kid. But I, I agree with you. You're right. I mean, if you're like a 14 year old kid trying to play the villain, it's kind of not very like, it's not very like appropriate you know um so well, how does that work then you're like 14 people get to know you and then all of a sudden you're 18 you're thriving can you then like turn a switch and like talk right. shit i don't i don't know i mean uh, i don't know either bro who it, knows and, and and maybe the sport doesn't need that right but i think that just again watching it from jiu-jitsu the story from a storytelling perspective to be able to say like oh pat Vellner is uh you know the, the number one canadian right and then you have someone else who's like you know no this person's yeah you know, i don't know whatever Yep. Yep. I, I think it certainly always brings an element of fun to it. And even if it just exists on social media and it's just athletes going back and forth and, you know, I, I think of, I think of a handful of guys that were pretty good at it back in the day and it certainly made it fun. Um, dude, listen, we could literally rift all day. 
Um, and, and I want to respect your time because I know you're a busy man, but there are, there are a few questions that I want to finish with for sure. you. Sure. Yeah. Rode my um, bike to work today. So I, I'm riding my bike home tonight. Hey, I love it. I love it. That's good. It's a nice little cool down. Well, first, before we get into the final five real quick, what's, what's your everyday fitness look like for you? I know you love jujitsu, man. You're diving headfirst into that with a passion, but what's a, what's a normal like day in the, in the, in the fitness life right now? So something that we've been leaning into a lot here at NC fit is this idea of RPE. So rate of perceived exertion. And it's something that I'm personally trying to spend more time and attention on because my RPE has been 10 or 20 years, meaning like sure. every workout, I'm always at a 10. And I, I have to learn to adjust my RP, um, throughout the week and throughout the, you know, et cetera. Now there's some days where you just want to throttle it, but I need to do a better job of like slowing it down a little bit. So what I'm typically doing is two to three days a week of jujitsu. And I am trying, this is, this is much harder to do than it, than it is. I'm trying to only go like all in, um, one day and then like, you know, 80% effort the other two days. Like, because when you go all in in jujitsu, it's just very aggressive and it really beats down your body. And so if you have flow rolls, they don't beat you down at all. But if you go level 10 with some really good guys, it's just your training. Just you get fatigued and you get sick and you just get injured or whatever. So in general, I like to do jujitsu two to three days a week. I like to come in. I like to take our classes almost every day. And then, um, on like the weekend, like, so on like a Sunday, I'll sometimes go for like a longer ruck or bike ride. Like I, I rode my bike today to work, which takes about 30 minutes. Um, but in general, I do our classes almost every day. And then I do two to three days a week of jujitsu. That's, that's pretty much what my training looks like. And then the mornings I work out with my daughter, but I just ride the C2 bike for like 10 minutes. It's pretty low key. That's awesome. But you're in there at least connecting with her and helping her get after what she needs to. Oh yeah, 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 for sure. For sure. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a good way for us to connect and we keep it super short. 10, 15 minutes is I found the sweet spot for the kids. Just get them in, get them working out and then get on with the day. I love that, man. You're creating habits for them at a young age. And of course they've seen you grinding for a long time, but just getting enough to keep them hungry for it, you know, bring them back the next day. That's, 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 it, that's, that's what it. matters. I love it. Well, listen, here's our final five, brother. Let's listen, the, the first question is, What's the most memorable CrossFit open workout that you've ever done and why? Oh, there was, so there was, I'll say it's, it's the first one that I ever did as a, um, a live, but it wasn't. Uh, yes. So it was me and Chris clever. Okay. We met at the tennis stadium of Carson. So we flew, I flew down to Carson and it was me, Dave Castro, Bosman and Chris clever. That's it. Pretty, and someone filming. Um, and it was just the most unique experience because we filmed it and that was going to be the open announcement. And at the time they had never done that before, but they didn't tell us the workout until like five minutes before we did it. No music, no nothing. Just me and Dave Castro was my judge. And that's it. That was really memorable. And then obviously a couple of years later, I did one against uh, rich Froning. I also did one with a group of like uh, champions in Santa Cruz one time. Those were all like really memorable, but the first one was the most memorable just because it was like so awkward. It was like, all right, guys, we're doing a <laughs> chest to bar, chest to bar, like uh, ladder of like, it was like a Fran, but it was chest to bar pull-ups. And it was just like, Dave, he's like, all right, three, two, one, go. And he's like, <laughs> he's like, anyways, there's no music. No, no. He's like, Hey, let's put on some music. Someone takes their phone, puts play on like, you know, Nickelback or something. It's like, all right, whatever. It's fine. <laughs> I love it. Dude, this is a perfect segue to the next question. What is most likely playing on the speakers? If you get to DJ the training session. Ooh. So if I'm like, like my like RP, like nine or 10, like I'm getting after it. Yeah. Or, let's say, let's say this is a day you're, you're, you're going deep. Um, some like some Drake, like some of the higher energy Drake obviously has a lower energy Drake, but I'd say Drake. And then, um, you know, if, if I'm kind of hitting that cardio, like on the way home on the bike, I'll, I'll hit the Luke Combs. There you go. Um, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Larry fleet, Luke Combs, Chris Stapleton fan. So little country bro we could vibe man i like i like my my music like i like my fitness constantly very just like that so I, <laughs> that's, that's it. money um okay if you could remove one movement from the crossfit methodology that gives you an advantage with its absence what movement are you pulling out a pistol oh get them out of here why don't you I'm out. They're out. <laughs> is it slow for you does it is it like one of those movements nowadays where you're just like oh it takes too long for me to get warmed up I think it's a little bit of both. Like I just was never phenomenal at them and I just don't really like yeah. them. And I'm just, I just, for me, if I never do another pistol again, I'd be perfectly happy. Um, and so, 
Yeah. But those are, I mean, even for me, I don't do many, uh, kipping handstand pushups sure. anymore. I am mainly strict. Um, but I'd say in general, I, I would say that the pistol like really stands out to me as, as not, not one I want. Hey, listen, I'm with you, man. It takes me a cool minute to get those warm and I visit them very few and far between. If I'm, if I'm trying to throw down, then maybe I'll, I'll consider it. But other than that, it's a, uh, I'm gonna keep it right in my back pocket there. Um, this is more of a, a, a deeper question here. So take a second if you sure. need, but overall, man, what kind of impact would you hope to, to leave on the CrossFit community? Oh, uh, man. You know, I, I hope I could actually impact more gym owners. Mm. And, you know, I, I made it a mission of mine for many, many years ago. And I've, I've been, I've been very consistent with this message for a decade that I want to see gym owners thrive. I want to see them be able to put food on the table for their families and make a good living because I believe if they can make a good living, they could then pay coaches a good living, which will then impact more members. Like, you know, our, our business model is really simple. Mm. Like I want to do what I love for a living. I want to impact as many coaches as I can do what they love for a living. If you impact more coaches, that'll impact more athletes. It's just the way it works. Like if you want to go from five coaches to 50, well, then maybe you have more locations, you have more digital clients, whatever it is, but you're impacting more people. And then with that greater audience, you could go do really good stuff. Yep. So I'd say that my, you know, lasting impression on cross would be, I want to be able to help gym owners thrive so that they could put more money in their coaches pockets, which will then attain and retain good talent to impact more members. And then with more members and more money for the gym owner, they could then go do really good stuff like whatever they're into, fundraising for military, law enforcement, pediatric cancer, you name it. I love it. I love it. Question five. And, yeah. and you you probably deal with this quite a bit, actually, you know, being someone that was been within the CrossFit space for so long and having family and the whole deal. If there's anyone in your life uh, that you'd love to see enter a CrossFit affiliate right? Like, let's say you get an opportunity to give a random person an elevator pitch on why they, why they should consider CrossFit. What are you saying to them? An elevator pitch on CrossFit? Yeah. Like someone who, you know, so here, here's my example is that, man, I've got some people that are really close to me that have watched me do CrossFit for many years. Big fans of it will be some of the first ones to buy tickets to the CrossFit games if I'm there throwing down. But then I'm like, cool. Hey, you want to come work out at the affiliate? And they're like, no, no, that's not for me. Yeah. So the, first off, I would, um, I don't even know if I would talk to them. That's what I would, I mean, yeah. I, I think that when they're ready, they'll come talk to you. I find that when you talk to them, you actually end up pushing further mm. than like, here's the deal. Do people know in your family that you're like the fitness guy? Like, does anybody in your family not know that you're the fitness guy? No. Like, yeah, everybody yeah. knows. Like it's very simple. Adrian's a fitness guy, right? Jason is a fitness guy. If someone's ever interested in pursuing it, you're probably going to be one of the first people they come and talk to. So by you trying to push it upon mm -hmm. them, I found that it gets you, it, 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 it adds another year for each time that you push. It, it probably, great, honestly, great number. No, yeah. it probably adds another six months to a year every time you push. So the recommendation would be to not say anything, but if you are going to say something, um, I would actually, this is a shout out to, um, to Juliet and Kelly Surratt, they're about to launch a new book. Okay. Their built to move book, I think is phenomenal. I would get them the book and just give it to them as a Christmas gift and let them see the value and what you have to offer. Now back to what I, I think everybody should have that. Hey, book. great. Listen, great segue. I'm going to put them on the list and reach out to Kelly and Juliet to have them on the show. Built to move just, yeah. And so then, but what I would say is, Hey, uh, mom, like you want to, do you want to work out? She's like, no, nah, it's not for me. I'm like, okay. Like, do you know that you could um, get better blood markers doing, you know, working out? Like, yeah. Do you know you could feel better, look better? You could live longer. You could do all those things. Do you know that? She'd be like, yeah, I know all that. Like, like none of that is new for people. Right. But what if I said, mom, you know that every day I go into the gym is an opportunity for me to hit myself a little bit of micro dose of adversity. And through these micro doses of adversity over time, I could build up the mental toughness and the tolerance so that when something in real life hits me hard, I'm better prepared to handle that. Would you be interested in having that capability? Mm. Like if you don't care about the blood markers, you don't care about the six pack abs, you don't care about the living longer. What about your ability to overcome adversity when it strikes you in real life? Come use fitness, which is something we can control to help you uh, work towards those goals. That's, that's what I would say. I mean, if, if, if everything else failed, I'd, I'd use the adversity component. I, I, I believe in that. I, I really believe in that, especially for the youth and kids. Yeah. 
Dude, and I think you embody it to a very strong degree. I think that's a really great answer, and and I think you you hit all the all the necessary uh you know markers there for for that particular question. I think that you know that resonates powerfully, and and to me, honestly, it's the it's one of the best examples of of why we have this podcast, and it's because um, CrossFit is a wonderful methodology. CrossFit is an amazing sport, but CrossFit is way more than fitness, and I think you literally defined it and expressed it very well in that answer. Um, but Jason, I appreciate you so much, man, for your time. You have got a, a very busy schedule and a lot going on. So thanks so much for giving it to me and to the audience. Um, Anytime. I enjoyed this conversation. I love I love talking to like like you, where you have a lot of knowledge. We could talk about things on different levels that also like lets me reminisce and, and, and go back to some days that were really um, powerful for me. So I'm, I'm down to chat anytime. I, I love, I, I loved connecting today. It was, it was awesome. I, well, I appreciate you. And we'll definitely put a plug in, uh, in this episode and then be able to bring you back for the future and talk a little bit more about maybe nerd on your, your own personal training through your years of competing, um, the development of your aerobic endurance, like the things that were almost some, some really big benchmark times for me in your particular athletic career where it was like, Oh, he broke through here. He broke through there and knocked down this barrier. So dude, we'll have plenty to discuss on another episode, but thanks so much brother for your time guys. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of more than fitness. And we will see you next time.